find people informed evolutionists like Dr. Dan Stern, Cardinal, they'll say, well, what, what's your definition of function to try and trip you up? Well, here's your definite, here's your best definition of function, biochemical interactions that have consequences for the cell. Now we can determine, okay, we see this activity and this activity is actually resulting in consequences for the cell. And so we can safely say that this is functional activity. There's another hypothesis. It's an interesting hypothesis. It's called the nucleoskeletal hypothesis, which basically suggests, Brian, that DNA is helping to regulate the volume of the nucleus. But we also understand that a lot of the DNA is serving as a mutational buffer. And a lot of that non-coding uh, DNA is helping the growing embryo is helping in all these different stages of the, the developmental process. And to say that all of this is squeezed into just 10% of the genome, is that not just pure imagination in your opinion, Brian? Yeah. Um, it's, I think their evolutionary presupposition is regulating their thinking a lot when it comes to stuff like that. And they don't even realize that, that, that that's happening. But a lot of what they believe about the genome and, and about uh, um, uh, organisms and stuff like that is being regulated by their evolutionary presuppositions about the past and that, that God's their thinking on it. Amen. Amen. Right. So do you, so if you were to put yourself in the mindset of the evolutionist, how do you think that they would respond to what appears to be a very logical explanation for this activity? Transcription is an energy intensive, resource intensive process. And so energy ATP is being used. So why would we argue that that's just noise? You know, put yourself in, in the mindset of the evolutionist. Well, what are they thinking about this, Brian? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> you see, so the point is it's intuitive, right? It's intuitive that if there's activity, and there's transcription or there's transcription factor binding, then it's intuitive to your normal person that this is functional binding. This is functional activity and not just noise. You'd have to believe in evolution. You'd have to have a, an evolutionary presupposition to conclude that this is just junk. The assumption is that it's left over from their evolutionary development and and that's why they assume that it's no biological function to it. And so in their in their expectation of their evolutionary views, they expect leftover uh, uh, DNA from the evolutionary development that is useless to the organism presently. And so that's Amen. what they expect. And then they see, oh, wait a minute, we don't know what this does. So therefore, that must be left over from that. Here's the fatal blow. And I want to reiterate this point. If you have high levels of non-specific binding, again, this goes back to the transcription factors that are binding to various parts of the, of the genome to initiate transcription. If this is just non-specific binding or it's random, like there's binding taking place, the evolutionist says, uh, Brian, and you can watch my impromptu debate with Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, and he talks about this. There's just the genome's messy. There's just random binding going on. It's not really doing anything. But here's the thing. Is what that you're Dr. Then doing? Is that Dr. Dan from Creation Myth? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he's a PhD, and so he's good to engage on this topic because he's at least informed of the evolutionist position. But the problem with that, with Dan's argument, is you're actually then titrating out transcription factors. That means we're not going to be able to get the transcription factor binding that's actually necessary in the genome. And so that kind of random binding that someone like Dr. Dan would talk about. It just gums up the operations within the cell. And that's why I would argue that most of the binding must be serving a purpose or else these operations in the cell would be extremely messy. It would, it would be, and we know the genome is not like that. Okay. And so I think that's an important point to make to these evolutionists that still want to desperately hold on to junk DNA. And so what I like to, to do, because all the arguments I've used to refute her on junk DNA, you've probably noticed, they're all from the conventional literature. 
<laughs> you know, I, we're refuting them with their own literature. And then we're also refuting them with logical inferences based on the data that we are reading about in the conventional literature. And they simply can't deal with it because it's their own, they're arguing against their own side, basically. Yeah, I'll, um, this is very, very good stuff. But yeah, so what she's basically saying uh, on the biological uh, or that the, this is useless and, 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 and Tompkins is a geneticist and he should know this. Right. And uh, he's not an evolutionary geneticist, so he's not going to assume presuppositions of evolutionists when, when he argues his position. Oh, right. Right. Well, but, yeah, go ahead. In my opinion, evolutionary theory is hindering our advancement in terms of understanding the genome because they're assuming junk. But we as creationists, we assume what? We assume treasure. And so when we go into the genome looking for treasure, what do we find? We find treasure. The evolutionists, <laughs> I find this funny, they're accidentally coming across these functional roles. And so they're accidentally finding out that these pseudogenes are functional. They're accidentally finding out that many of these ERVs are functional. Imagine they went in with their millions and millions and millions of dollars of government grants looking for treasure. I predict they'd find a lot more treasure, especially because they're just accidentally coming across these functions. 